Women of the Titanic. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. On the night of April 14, 1912, 2,224 people faced doom in the middle of the frigid North Atlantic. The luxury liner hailed as unsinkable was about to do just that and disappear beneath the waves. The tragedy has long captured the public imagination, with heroic tales of millionaire John Jacob Astor going down with the ship like a gentleman, and fictionalized romances about people that weren't really on board. Today, let's meet a handful of the real women who were on board that terrible night. We'll learn more about the famous first-class ladies like Madeline Astor and Molly Brown, but also meet some of the lesser-known women of all three classes, including the only black family aboard. And we'll meet a crew member who was truly unsinkable. First-class passengers aboard the luxury liner were a who's who of British and American high society. Their tickets cost between 30 and 870 pounds, the equivalent of $4,000 to $120,000 today. They had the best accommodations money could buy, with elegant staterooms, a gymnasium, a swimming pool, Turkish baths, and two promenades. If you'd like to know more about what they ate in their sumptuous dining room, check out my video on the Titanic's final meal. First-class passengers had the best chance of surviving in the disaster, with 83% of children, 97% of women, and 32% of men living to tell their tales. Helen Churchill Candy was the child of a middle-class New York family. Her husband was abusive and abandoned her. To support her two small children, Helen wrote articles on housekeeping and childcare for the Ladies' Home Journal, Good Housekeeping, Harper's Bazaar, and Woman's Home Companion. She moved her family to the Oklahoma Territory and wrote captivating articles about life on the frontier as a single mother, cementing her fame. In 1900, she penned the practical feminist book, How Women May Earn a Living. Now a famous author, she moved to Washington, D.C. and became one of the first professional interior decorators. She remodeled the West Wing of the White House for Theodore and Edith Roosevelt. In 1912, she traveled to Europe to research a new book on interior design. This self-made woman was now wealthy enough to book first-class passage home aboard the Titanic. Helen had to jump in to a lifeboat and broke her ankle in the fall. Despite her swelling leg, she took up one of the oars and paddled the boat out of harm's way. Helen later gave an in-depth interview about the disaster to Collier's magazine. Faced with death, she lived the rest of her life to the fullest. She became even more active in the feminist and suffragette movement to win women the right to vote. During World War I, she worked as a nurse in Italy with the Red Cross. One of her patients was Ernest Hemingway. After the war, she traveled to Japan, China, Indonesia, and Cambodia, and wrote two popular books about her adventures, Angkor the Magnificent and New Journeys in Old Asia, popularizing Asian tourism among Westerners. Helen was a founding member of the Society of Women Geographers and lived to the age of 90. Molly Brown was born in Missouri to Irish Catholic immigrants. At 18, she moved with her siblings to Colorado. As an attractive young woman, she set her sights on getting ahead the best way a woman could in the Old West, by marrying rich. But she fell in love with a poor but intelligent man, J.J. Brown, and decided that she would be happier with him. J.J. turned out to be a good bet as his engineering acumen helped the Ibex Mining Company strike gold, and he was awarded with 12,000 shares and a seat on the board. The couple bought a mansion in Denver in which they raised a son and daughter. They became prominent philanthropists and members of Denver High Society. Molly learned French, German, Italian, and Russian, and fell in love with French culture. After 23 years of marriage, the couple privately separated but remained close friends. In 1912, Molly traveled to France to visit her daughter who was studying there. 
But when she learned that her grandson was sick, she booked passage back home on the Titanic. During the mayhem of the sinking, she helped others evacuate to lifeboats. She was finally persuaded to board one herself and took an oar opposite Helen Churchill Candy. Molly urged the crewmen in charge to return after the ship had disappeared below the waves to pick up more survivors. But her pleadings and threats to throw the crewman overboard were rebuffed as he was fearful that the boat would be pulled under by suction or swamped by those drowning in the water. Once they were picked up by the Carpathia, Molly organized a committee of other first-class survivors. Together, they sought the needs of the second and third-class survivors and offered informal counseling. Her heroism earned her the name The Unsinkable Molly Brown. Two years later, she ran for Senate and might have been the first female U.S. Senator, but upon the outbreak of World War I, she dropped out of the race to go to France and organize relief efforts in the country she had always loved. In her 60s, she took to working as an actress. She died in 1932, age 65. Lady Lucy Duff Gordon was born into a middle-class family and raised in Canada and the UK. She survived her first shipwreck in the English Channel at the age of 12. At 21, she married a man who turned out to be a philandering alcoholic. She left him and in order to support herself and her daughter Esme, she began working as a dressmaker out of her mother's London apartment. After three years of hard work, she opened Maison Lucille, and her designs attracted the notice of trend-setting royals, aristocrats, and stars of stage and screen. Lucy was the first designer to train professional models and stage runway shows complete with lighting, decor, and music. In 1900, she married Scottish baronet Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon. The couple were on their way to visit Maison Lucille in New York aboard the Titanic. Lucy and Cosmo escaped in a lifeboat with only 10 other people. The boat had a capacity of 40. On their return home, Cosmo was censured for taking a place on a lifeboat when it was supposed to be women and children first. Worse yet, witnesses claimed Cosmo bribed the crew on board the lifeboat not to return to the scene of the wreck to pick up survivors. The pair were questioned during the official inquiry of the disaster, but they maintained that the money they paid to crew members was to ease their suffering as they had lost everything in the sinking. Three years later, Lucy and Cosmo booked passage on the Lusitania, but canceled their plans when Lucy fell ill. The Lusitania was torpedoed by a German U-boat and sunk in 18 minutes, killing 1,200 of the 1,900 people on board. Lucy's design career ended after it became public that she did not personally create many of the designs sold by her fashion house. But she remained a prominent fashion critic until her death in 1935, age 71. I find all three of these self-made women incredibly inspiring. They utilized their talents, developed their skills, and pursued learning at a time when the roles of women were severely limited. If you share this passion for creative learning, then check out Skillshare. This online learning community has thousands of engrossing classes on topics like graphic design, photography, creative writing, fine art, music, and a lot more. I've been finding focus for my creative energy with Holly Coley Murchison's class, Creating Your Dream Career, Uncovering and Applying Your Creative Strengths, and picking up some great tips from fellow self-taught YouTuber Marquez Brownlee in his class, YouTube Success, Script, Shoot, and Edit with MKBHD. So if you want to develop new creative skills or hone old ones, then check out Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. And now, let's reboard the Titanic. Madeline Astor was the daughter of a wealthy Brooklyn manufacturer and socialite. She was a bright student and a popular debutante. 
At 18, she married 47-year-old millionaire John Jacob Astor IV, who had recently divorced his first wife. The couple wed amid scandal and took off for a seven-month honeymoon in Egypt and Europe. They booked passage home on the Titanic when Madeline was five months pregnant. While waiting to board a lifeboat, Madeline gave her fur shawl to a third-class passenger to keep her baby son warm. Madeline, her maid, and her nurse had to climb through a promenade window to get into a tilting lifeboat. John Jacob asked the crewman if he could accompany his wife as she was in a delicate condition, but he was told that no men would be allowed on until all the women and children were off the foundering ship. He and his valet died in the sinking. In August, Madeline gave birth to her son, John Jacob Jakey Astor VI. She was left a wealthy widow. Madeline remarried twice and had two more sons, William and Henry. She moved to Palm Beach, Florida and died there in 1940 at the age of 46. Noelle Leslie, Countess of Rothes, was the only child of a wealthy London family. At 22, she wed Norman Leslie, the 19th Earl of Rothes, scion of an ancient Scottish clan. The couple and their two sons, Malcolm and John, split their time between their mansion in Chelsea and their family estate in Aberdeenshire. Noelle was renowned for her philanthropy and threw marvelous masked balls and garden parties to raise funds from her wealthy friends to help the less fortunate. She was especially interested in education, the Red Cross, and providing milk for poor children. In early 1912, Norman traveled to the U.S. and Canada for business. Noelle set sail aboard the Titanic to meet up with him and tour North America. The couple shared an inkling to buy an orange grove in California. Throughout the ordeal, Noelle calmly led the other women aboard Lifeboat 8 with decisiveness and optimism. She steered the boat through most of the night, resting only to comfort a young Spanish newlywed, Maria Pinasco, whose husband had been lost. Once aboard the Carpathia, Noelle dedicated herself to making sure the women and children of third class were fed and warm. She made clothes for the babies and the crew called her the plucky little countess. Noelle became famous for her heroism during the tragedy, but she did not welcome the publicity and praised the bravery of others, including the officer in charge of her lifeboat. She gave him a silver pocket watch and he gifted her the brass number plate from their lifeboat. When World War I broke out, her husband Norman served as a colonel at the front. Back home in the UK, Noelle converted both Leslie House and their London mansion into hospitals for wounded soldiers. She worked as a nurse, and when Norman was wounded in action, she cared for him herself. Norman died in 1927, age 50, and Noelle remarried to Colonel Claude McPhee. She continued her charity work until her own death in 1956, aged 77. Ida Strauss was born in 1849 to a Jewish family in Germany. She and her parents and siblings later immigrated to New York City. At 22, she married Isidore Strauss, who worked with his father at their family crockery business, which was housed in the basement of Macy's department store. Ida and Isidore had seven children together and were especially devoted to each other. Whenever he was away on business, he wrote to her daily. Isidore and his brother grew their business into glass and china and were eventually able to gain full ownership of R.H. Macy and Co. By their 60s, Ida and Isidore were very well off and decided to take a tour of Europe together. After helping Ida's maid into a lifeboat, the elderly couple were offered places as well, but Isidore refused to take a spot when there were still women and children in need of rescue. He urged his wife to board, but she refused, saying, We have lived together for many years. Where you go, I go. Ida and Isidore were last seen standing arm in arm on the deck of the sinking ship. Second class passengers were tourists, academics, and middle class families. The average adult second class ticket cost 13 pounds, the equivalent of $2,000 today. Second-class travel on the Titanic was akin to first-class on other ocean liners. They had their own library and promenade deck. 
These passengers fared second best in the disaster, with 100% of children, 86% of women, but only 8% of men surviving. The Hart Family Seven-year-old Ava and her parents Esther and Benjamin were a Jewish family from London. They were immigrating to Canada and had booked passage aboard the USS Philadelphia, but a coal strike kept it from sailing and many of her passengers were transferred to the Titanic. Upon hearing of their new booking, Esther felt apprehensive. She thought calling a ship unsinkable was flying in the face of God. While on board, she slept only during the day and kept vigil fully clothed all night over her sleeping daughter. When Titanic struck the iceberg at 11.40 p.m., Esther felt the bump and woke her husband asking him to investigate. He returned with news of the impact, bundled his daughter in a blanket, and placed her and his wife in a lifeboat. Ava recalled her father's last words to her, be a good girl and hold mummy's hand. Benjamin died that night. Eva later described the terrible scene of the sinking of the ship. The worst thing I can remember are the screams. It seemed as if once everybody had gone, drowned, finished, the whole world was standing still. There was nothing, just this deathly, terrible silence in the dark night and the stars overhead. After being rescued, Esther and Eva returned to London. Eva was plagued by nightmares of the terrible and traumatic sinking and her father's final farewell. At 23, following the death of her mother, she decided to book passage aboard a ship to Singapore. After confronting her fears head on, her nightmares stopped. Eva had a colorful life. She was a professional singer and organized entertainment and supplies for people sheltering during the Blitz in World War II. Later, she worked as a political organizer, a magistrate, and a Soro Optimist volunteer. She was named a member of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, or MBE, in 1974, and she gave numerous interviews about her experience on the Titanic. She died in 1996. There is a pub in London named in her honor. The La Roche family, father Joseph and daughters Simone and Louise were the only known black and mixed race passengers on board the Titanic. Joseph was born in Haiti. He moved to Paris at 15 to study engineering and there he met and married Juliet. But racial discrimination made life in France difficult for the family. So when Joseph's uncle, Cincinnatus Leconte, was elected president of Haiti, the family decided to move there in search of better opportunities. The La Roches planned to travel later in the year, but the ship they originally booked required children to remain in the nursery. They didn't want to be separated, and when they discovered that Juliet was pregnant, they changed their booking to the Titanic. After the impact, Joseph and Juliet carried their sleeping daughters up to the deck. Joseph put his family in a lifeboat and kissed them goodbye. He did not survive. On board the Carpathia, Juliet was unable to find diapers for Simone and Louise, as all available linen was being used in the body recovery effort. At dinner, she sat on her napkins and smuggled them away to use as nappies. Without Joseph, Juliet decided to return to her family in France. There she gave birth to a son whom she named Joseph after his father. Baby Louise was the eighth longest living survivor and was active in the Titanic Historical Society until her death in 1998, aged 87. The West Family Barbara West was 10 months old when her father Arthur, pregnant mother Ada, and older sister Constance set sail. Barbara was the second youngest passenger on board. The family were headed for a new life in Florida, where Arthur planned to work in the orange business. As the ship began to sink, Ada and Arthur dressed their children warmly and secured their life belts. Arthur placed his family in a lifeboat and then went back to their cabin for a thermos of hot milk for his crying children. Upon returning, he found that their lifeboat was being lowered into the sea. He climbed down by a rope to kiss his wife and children goodbye before returning to the deck of the doomed ship. 
baby Barbara could still recall years later the screaming of passengers and her father's final goodbye. Now widowed, Ada took her children back to England. Barbara became a school teacher and lived to the age of 96. She was the second last living Titanic survivor. Third class passengers or steerage were mostly immigrants from Europe, hoping to start new lives in the US and Canada. Passage for an adult cost seven pounds, about $960 today. There were several mothers crossing the sea alone with their children to reunite with husbands who had gone ahead to find work and housing before sending money home for their family's passage. Third class on the Titanic was lavish compared to the Spartan conditions on most immigrant ships. Rather than large dormitories, they slept in private family cabins with mattresses, pillows, and blankets. They had electric light and heating, a common room and dining room where food was served, and shared bathrooms. Most ships expected steerage passengers to bring their own food for the week-long journey and relieve themselves in buckets. They were even allowed to walk outside on the poop deck, but they were not permitted to enter the second and third class areas, and metal gates kept them from mingling. In the chaos, the crew left many of these gates locked, and confused third class passengers were trapped below deck as the ship sank. Third class had the lowest survival rate with only 34% of children, 46% of women, and 16% of men surviving. Those who could speak English had a better chance of navigating their way to a lifeboat and thus had a slightly better survival rate. The Goodwin family. Augusta Goodwin married her husband Frederick on Christmas Day, 1894. They had six children together, Lillian, Charles, William, Jesse, Harold, and baby Sidney. Frederick's brother immigrated from England to Niagara, New York, and he wrote to Frederick about job opportunities at the power plant there. Relatives raised money to pay for the large family's passage to a new life. All eight of the Goodwins perished. The youngest child, Sydney, was later identified by DNA to have been the unknown child. His body was recovered from the sea by the crew of the Mackie Bennett. He had been carefully dressed in a gray coat with fur collar and cuffs, brown serge frock, petticoat, flannel garment, pink wool singlet, brown shoes, and stockings. The sailors who found him paid for a monument to honor the little boy and he was buried with a copper pendant that read, Our Babe. The Dean Family Melvina Dean was just two months old and the youngest passenger on the Titanic when she left England with her parents, Ada and Bertram, and her two-year-old brother, Bertram Jr. The family were headed for Wichita, Kansas, where Bertram Sr. planned to run a tobacconist with his cousin. Bertram felt the collision in the night and woke his family. Together they dressed and made it above deck where Ada and the children were put in a lifeboat, and Bertram bid them goodbye. The family spent several weeks in New York waiting to hear news of Bertram, but he did not survive and his body was never recovered. Heartbroken and with no money or clothes, Ada just wanted to get home. The White Star Line offered them passage back to England aboard the RMS Adriatic, where baby Melvina became a celebrity. The ladies on the ship offered to hold her in shifts. In her later years, Melvina gave numerous interviews about her experience. She was the last living Titanic survivor. She died in 2009, aged 97. Crew members aboard the Titanic, as with most ocean liners, were primarily men. There were 885 male crew aboard, 21% of whom survived. These included officers, deck crew, engineers, and various service workers. The 23 female crew members were stewardesses who provided meals and service to the passengers. 20 of them survived. If you thought Molly Brown was unsinkable, then wait until you meet Violet Jessup. As a young woman, Violet contracted tuberculosis and was given months to live. She recovered and at 21 began working as a ship stewardess. She was on board the Olympic, Titanic's sister ship in 1911 when it collided with another ship, nearly sinking both. 
Luckily, the Olympic was able to limp back to port with no loss of life. Seven months later, Violet's hard work got her a job on board the ultra-luxurious Titanic for its maiden voyage. This seemed like a fantastic job opportunity. During the sinking, Violet was ordered by an officer to climb in a lifeboat to assure reluctant lady passengers that it was safe. Once secure in the lifeboat, Violet was handed a baby, which she kept safe through the terrible night. The next morning aboard the Carpathia, a crying woman, presumably the mother, grabbed the baby and ran off without saying a word. By 1916, World War I was in full swing, and Violet, now trained as a nurse, was working aboard another of Titanic's sister ships, the Britannic, which had been requisitioned as a medical ship and stationed in the Aegean Sea. The Britannic hit a U-boat mine, which ripped apart the bulkhead. This time, Violet didn't make it to a lifeboat in time, which was lucky, as most of the 30 people who perished were in lifeboats that were launched while the ship was still sailing at full speed. The boats were sucked into the propellers. Violet instead helped her patients board lifeboats until the captain called for all to abandon ship. By then, the lifeboats had been launched, and Violet had no choice but to jump into the sea. She survived her third oceanic ordeal and wasn't scared off. She continued to work aboard ships, but thankfully never endured another shipwreck. Years after retiring, she received a phone call asking if she had rescued a baby on the Titanic. After confirming that she had, a woman's voice said, I was that baby, laughed and hung up. Miss Unsinkable Violet Jessup died in 1971 at the age of 83. The disaster of the RMS Titanic claimed the lives of 1,514 people. Those lucky enough to escape were forever altered, the courses of their lives changed, and families torn apart. The tragedy prompted numerous reforms in maritime safety, including mandatory lifeboats, better training and drills, and 24-hour radio watch, all of which saved countless lives. Heroic tales of the sacrifices of men aboard also popularized the convention of saving women and children first. Before this, it had been every person for themselves in the panic and pandemonium, and women, and especially children, had very low chances of surviving a shipwreck. After three hours in darkness, hearing the screams and cries of the dying but unable to help, Survivors finally spotted the rockets of the RMS Carpathia on its way to rescue them. In lifeboat 8, as the Countess steered and weary and heartbroken passengers rowed towards salvation, they sang a hymn together. Lead kindly light amid the circling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. A special thank you goes to my patrons, Cassandra Robinson, Bree Feig, and Mikhail O'Gorman. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. Thank you for watching.